Well, welcome to another edition of Right Voices. I'm John Hart, the co-founder of C3 Solutions, the conservative coalition for climate solutions, and I'm the editor of our news magazine, C3. Today, we're honored to be joined by Congressman Doug Lamborn. Representative Lamborn has represented Colorado's 5th Congressional District since 2007. He serves on the House Armed Services Committee, and he's the vice chairman of the House Committee on Natural Resources. And he's also a member of the Conservative Climate Caucus in the House, where he's a distinguished leader on many fronts regarding energy and environmental policy. Congressman, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, John, it's great to be on your show and to have a dis discussion with you, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, good. Well, glad glad to have you. Um, well, well t tell us about you and your district. Why did you um, Why did you run for Congress and and describe Colorado's fifth district and what's unique about it? Well, even though I grew up in Kansas, went to the University of Kansas, uh, and my children were born there for the most part, we thought that Colorado Springs was a great place to raise a family. A lot of outdoor activities. It's a conservative area, uh, open for business, and um, uh, we just thought it was a good environment for raising children. My children were involved in scouting and things like that, but I have four boys and one girl. So the outdoor activities and other recreational opportunities, scouting, et cetera, we just thought it was a great place to raise a family, and that's why we ended up in Colorado Springs. That's great. Well, yeah, and I, I went to KU. We were talking before before we started to so have a, a master's in journalism from KU. So uh, it's, a, it's a great, great place to, to grow up. But uh, but Colorado's now home and I'm, I'm out in Maryland. But, um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned you mentioned scouts. So I, I think, Congressman, there's we're at an interesting moment in our politics in the Republican Party. I don't my observation has been uh, it's kind of, I think it's interesting that there's something in the House. One of the biggest caucuses is called the Conservative Climate Caucus. And, you know, five, 10 years ago, that may not have happened. But what I've always known growing up in Kansas, growing up, uh, you know, in in an area that's not, wasn't all or urban, is that people care about the natural environment very deeply. And one of the, one of the scout mottos or lessons is you leave the campsite better off than you found it. And uh, do you think it's true that that when, I guess, how do your constituents think about conservation broadly? Do they, do they, is that a common sense view that people have when they think about the environment and climate? Well, people in Colorado Springs and Colorado in general uh, love the outdoors. They love the environment. Colorado is blessed with a wonderful environment, the mountains and everything else. And they want those preserved and kept for future generations. Uh, people take advantage of the opportunities, whether it's hiking, biking, skiing, uh, all kinds of activities, and they wanna make sure that their children will have those as well. Uh, people love wildlife. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a strong outdoor sentiment for protecting what we have in Colorado. Yeah, and, and in, your, in your leadership, what, why did you decide to join the Conservative Climate Caucus. Why was that that an association you wanted to make with your- Well, sometimes it seems like if you just read in the media voices that are speaking out about the environment, it seems to be coming from the left, from the progressives and liberals. And I don't want people out there in society to think that they are the only ones who care about the outdoors, about the environment, about the world that we live in. Now, our solutions and proposals may differ, uh, and we should have that discussion. I'm sure we will in the next few moments ourselves. But uh, we want to make sure that the voices of those who are conservative, Republican, on the right, are being heard as well. Right. And well, one of those issues, there's there's a few to cover just on the Natural Resources Committee. You're, you're an expert on these matters, and particularly uh, with the district you represent. So what we often hear from people on the left is they they make the case that, well, if you say you care about climate change, if you accept that there's some human contribution to CO2 and global warming, therefore, you must be completely opposed to fossil fuels. You must do everything you can to stop fossil fuel production. And you 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 push back on that and and give me the counter argument to that progressive left kind of degrowth position that we hear so often. Well, whether it's that or so many other conservation and environmental issues, John, uh, the liberals and progressives, they deal in mandates. They restrict 
your options. Whereas conservatives uh, want to maybe provide incentives to change people's behaviors, but not mandates. An incentive, whether it's a tax break or something like that, or a government subsidy, subsidy is there if you want to take advantage of it, but you don't have to. Whereas the liberals step in and they say, we're going to tell you what kind of car to drive. We're going to get rid of certain kinds of cars in a few years. We're going to tell you what kind of stoves you cook your meals on. We're not going to give you any options. We're just going to tell you what to do because we know better. And I don't like that approach. And I hope people uh, out there who listen to the two sides appreciate the fact that we're we're supporting choice and freedom and that in the long run is a lot better quality of life yeah and i think one interesting thing about the biden administration uh is that it seems that they're telling american producers no while asking foreign dictators to produce more they're yeah, saying yeah, that's, is that a fair characterization of what the biden that's very fair john there's a real disconnect and and we want to inject common sense in this discussion for instance, some of the proposals that the Biden administration and their allies will come up with have a minuscule effect, if any, on world carbon dioxide uh, production. Yeah, and, 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 and explain why. That's an important point for people to understand that they often miss. Well, th they talk about how climate change is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not what happens in a particular city or state or country. It's worldwide. And... There's a lot of atmosphere in this world. There's a lot of uh, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, et cetera, in this world. And a little bit of more emissions in your community, if you drive a car instead of taking a bus, is not going to make any difference in the big scheme of things if you run the numbers. Uh, I mean, you may want to do that. That's your choice. Fine. But if you're mandated to drive a certain kind of transportation or ride and not have your own, but you don't look at the mathematical equation and, and, and run the numbers on whether it makes an impact or not, you'll fall for their line of reasoning and you'll just sort of mindlessly go along with it. We want to inject common sense. If someone has a solution that makes a significant difference, like, uh, like let's let's try to bring India and China and the major emitters of carbon dioxide in this world into the discussion. That would make a difference. Uh, if we're already really paring back the use of carbon dioxide and emitting it in the United States, and actually we've been, I think over the last 20 years, the biggest decreaser, the cutter of carbon dioxide emissions of anybody in the world, um, but we don't, we're not getting credit for that. But but if we're if the proposals are not really making a difference, then why pursue them? It it just becomes uh, virtue signaling. It's right. to make people feel good, or it's to exercise power over people's lives. And if you use common sense, we would say, well, that really doesn't make a difference. It's not cost effective. You, you run the numbers. You run the cost per unit of carbon dioxide that's saved and um, or prevented, and it doesn't make sense. We want to have that common sense discussion and decide whether the proposals are worth pursuing. And if they're not, let's drop them and do something else. But there is a real mentality with some on the left that want to tell people what to do. And those of us who are conservative conservationists sort of uh, that rubs us the wrong way. So what would you like to see happen on public lands in Colorado? What what reforms would you like to see enacted or, or barriers lowered, if you will? Uh, there's a place for wilderness, but there are people on the left who want to turn everything into wilderness. And that may sound good because they'll say, oh, it'll be there for a future generation. But the trouble with wilderness is no one can access wilderness. So whether it's for this generation or future generations, no one can access it. So it maybe doesn't do you any good personally if you can't go out there and access that land or if, or it's not going to be managed. It can't be managed for invasive species. It can't be managed for wildfire prevention. And 
I believe in the philosophy, at least originally, of the Bureau of Land Management, uh, the land of many uses. I think the more people that can enjoy public lands in a variety of different ways, the better off society is. Not just keeping land for one exclusive segment, like the, the backpackers who stay off of trails and they bushwhack through the wilderness and they, they can uh, stay out there for a week on their own. You know, that's a small subset of our population that can do that kind of, take that kind of approach. Uh, there are people who fish, people who hunt. There are ex extractions of resources that we can responsibly do, like lumber or oil and gas or yeah. minerals. Uh, there are things that a land of many uses should lend itself to, not just the exclusive use of one set of people. So when it comes to wilderness, rather than declare everything wilderness, as just as, this is just one example, John, Let's use it sparingly where it really counts, but let much or most of the land be accessible to people like with their bicycles and, and things like that. You can't do that on uh, in wilderness areas uh, where people have access to the lands and can enjoy them. I think the more lands for the more for more people and the more uses, the better off we are. Yeah, and and earlier you mentioned that that we haven't gotten credit for reducing emissions. One of the 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 innovations that is the result of American ingenuity is the fracking revolution, where the the our ability to get cleaner natural gas has actually caused the United States to to be on a better path in terms of of emissions than the rest of the world. Because it it seems like uh, it, the the question you have to the decision you have to make as as an elected official is. What is best for our national security to tell people in Colorado we can't access energy? It doesn't mean we're not going to have energy. It means we're just going to get it somewhere else. We're going to get it from India, China, Russia. And is that good for our national security or is that is that not a good good option for us? John, that is not a good option. Uh, it's not good for national security when people who want to do us harm and, and some of the OPEC countries are not our friends and they would do us harm if they got the chance. And when we shut down American and domestic oil and gas, it doesn't stop the demand. It just takes it offshore and produces it offshore in places like Russia. Now, I know we have Russia sanctions, but countries like China and India are getting around those sanctions. Uh, you have countries like Iran producing oil, uh, other countries as well. And when they do it, not only is it a national security problem, and not only does it send jobs overseas that could be created here in the United States, along with the royalties and tax revenue that comes with that, they are not as clean as the United States. The environmental regulations in the United States, whether it's for water or air or reclaiming mining when you're, when you're done with it or producing oil and gas, is much more stringent than, than almost any country out there, certainly more than countries like China and Russia. So when, and some of the African countries or Middle Eastern countries. So when we produce energy or extract minerals, we do it much more responsibly. So that's another problem by sending it overseas. It's not done as cleanly as it's done here. That's right. And, and it's and another key part of that is as we talk about what you're describing is the all of the above energy strategy of, of making use of, of, of oil, natural gas, uh, and also promoting renewables. Maybe we haven't talked about nuclear. We could talk about nuclear if you want. But a lot of those, a lot of those quote cleaner technologies, that the word clean is a bit of a misnomer because there's no energy is all about trade-offs. You know, the 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 conservative economist Thomas Sowell always talked about there are no solutions in life, there are only trade-offs. And and for example, with solar or wind, you have to have critical minerals with batteries for electric vehicles. You have to have critical minerals. And a lot of people who follow this debate, they don't understand that you've got to get those from somewhere. They're not just going to magically appear. And and again, if we don't get them in Colorado, we get them in China. Is that is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And it's really hypocritical of the Biden administration and its allies in Congress to not know that. I mean, they want clean energy, which means um, solar panels and electrical generating windmills and 
electric vehicles and those kinds of things, but those pre require huge amounts of lithium, cobalt, um, uh, copper, and uh, lots of other minerals, but they want to shut down the American sources of those minerals, which means a country like China, which produces, I think, half of the world's critical, uh, well, the rare earth elements in particular, and refines those. Uh, and they can hold that over our head if in a time of crisis and embargo us and make they life very difficult. But when we send it to places like China, we're reducing government jobs, or excuse me, American jobs, we're creating a national security risk, and we are letting other countries have leverage over us. And these are countries that don't have the same environmental standards as we do, John. So for all those reasons, we should consider having American produced energy and minerals and, and things like that, and we'll do it responsibly. Yeah, and another another issue, Congressman, that you've been a leader on is the issue of of land, just land management beyond accessing uh, uh, oil, gas, and critical minerals. Is the issue of, of dealing with our forest and and there's there is you know we can we could have a forty five minute conversation on extreme weather and you know there's always going to be extreme weather, but but it is true that that the predictions are that when the planet's a little bit warmer, it's those happen more frequently. But the big but in that is the the outcome what happens in in a wildfire situation is the land management component is extremely important and isn't talked about enough because the media focuses just on overall temperatures overall co2 but describe how critically important it is to have smart management of our public lands and our forests and i know you have a bill on that um the the locally led restoration act describe describe a little bit of your vision of what that bill would specifically do yeah, thank you, John. This is an important subject. And, and this gets to the conservative conservationist approach where we manage our resources, our public lands, our forests. We don't restrict access and say no one can ever walk in there except for a privileged few. And it gets overgrown with brush and fuels and it, it ends up disappearing in a fire and that doesn't help anybody. So I believe that smart management is the way to go. You referred to that earlier. The bill I'm proposing with the great help of my staff is to say that private contractors can go in and make proposals to the forestry service for clearing and, and uh, managing the production of, of lumber and timber off of those lands as long as there's at least a 10% salvage component, which is redu reducing the brush and the fuels that aren't doing anyone any good and need to be cleared out or that will create the possibility of a bad wildfire. So right now, private contractors can't come in and make these kinds of proposals. It's all a one-way street. So that's what this bill would do to open up the discussion between the forestry service and private uh, contractors. Yeah, and I'll, I'll get just an anecdote on my, my own land. I've got I have 62 acres. I'm near Harper's. I'm in Maryland, but not far from Harper's Ferry in Antietam. And and my area has been has been hit by the emerald ash borer. It's a it's a it's a bug that I'm sure you've heard of. It comes it, it came from Asia, just human transportation. And every few decades, there's a there's a catastrophe of trees, whether it's the chestnut trees uh, that were wiped out. Uh, and, and again, that's something that a lot of people on the left, they don't understand. If you've never managed land, if you're not on top of that issue, if you're not on your own land, managing it very, very aggressively, you'll lose control of it really quick. And I have a relatively small, particularly compared to Western lands, it's a tiny little sliver of land, but, uh, but it's an eye opening you know, thing to realize when you look at the scope of some of the forests out west. Well, those of us who love our lands and our resources, we want to keep them for the future. We want them to have the maximum benefit to everyone who's who, who uses them or enjoys them or even just sees them out of their car as they drive by. So that requires wise management, not just letting them go and forgetting about them and hoping for the best. That's not really a, a good policy at all. 
Right. So I, I'm tonight. Tonight, there's going to be the, the Republican debates. Um, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask who you like the best. But but, you know, we've talked about this, the need to have there, there is very much a conservative conservation vision that's different from the top down command and control Green New Deal. And, and just as as an aside on the Green New Deal, Nick Loris, who's our, our VP of public, public policy, he did a lot of the research on the Green New Deal when he was at the Heritage Foundation and found that it would have almost zero impact on global temperatures if it was actually enacted. So just to your point earlier is if you if the the key if you really want innovation you want temperatures to go down is to promote economic freedom. You know that free economies are twice as clean as less free. So it is so what what happens in political debates so often is as as I'm sure you know is Republicans generally don't like the questions on climate because they feel like they 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 respond to it like it's an altar call. Like you have to say you believe or you don't believe. And I guess, do you feel that tension? And how how would you, if you're going to advise these campaigns, how would you suggest they, if they're asked a question on climate, like they were on the last debate, how would you suggest they think about that or answer it? Don, that's a great question. I would I'll, I would say what I, we were talking about earlier, that choice and incentives are better than mandates and forcing decisions that restrict our freedoms. That's the always the better approach, number one. Number two, prosperity is vital. A country that has more economic freedom and more choices is more prosperous. And if you have more prosperity, you have more money to deal with problems. Uh, the poorest countries in the world, they have horrible environmental situations. Look at Haiti. Uh, the country of Haiti, pretty much uh, the people are poor. They've been oppressed. There's corruption. They've cut down pretty much every tree in the country to make firewood to uh, cook with or stay warm. And wood is a bad fuel because of the pollution that it creates and you lose your trees. It's just bad all the way around, but they don't have the prosperity or the money to go out and have more uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, sources of energy or to have choices for their energy. And that's an extreme example. Uh, but when you have more prosperity and more money to address problems, you can deal with those problems in a way that uh, uh, creates a cleaner environment without restricting people's freedom. So prosperity is important and freedom is important. Yeah. Well, Congressman, those those would be, if, if they talk about freedom and prosperity, I think those would be really good, really good answers and starts to that, to that conversation. So uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time. We'll, we'll be following your work closely in the House. And any, anything else that, that is on the horizon that we haven't talked about that I know the House passed HR, HR 1 was a big achievement. And of course, you know, it, it's it hasn't gone anywhere in the Senate. Do you think the House will try again with some? And, and it was significant that that the speaker and your colleagues named the first bill around lower lowering energy costs. That was a fundamental statement, not just a policy, but a values of what of what Republicans care about. And, and where do you see that that heading uh, the rest of this year and next year? You know, John, if you have lower energy costs and that comes from having more choices, letting people decide, not channeling them into only one type of energy to run their car or heat their home with or cook their stoves uh, and cook their food with. Uh, if you have choices, then the market decides. And for people who are on the margins, people that are not as successful financially at this point in their lives, uh, it makes a big difference how much, how high their energy bills are, their gasoline bills, their heating bills, and it restricts their choices. They can't buy as much clothes for their kids or medicine if they're spending higher money uh, paying bills for high cost of electricity. And in places like California, you have astronomical electricity costs. And a lot of that's based on government decisions and restricting people's choices and not allowing the free market to operate. So freedom and choice leads to prosperity and gives people more options, more money in their pocket and that makes a big difference in the quality of life. We want a good quality of life for Americans. We deserve it. We work for it. And we shouldn't eliminate different choices 
that take that away from us. But yet that's what the liberals want and that's what we're fighting against. Right. So you're, you're not against electric vehicles. You're not against solar or wind. You're just give people the choice to buy what they want to buy. And Exactly. Yeah. M maybe an electric hybrid is the best way to go. Better than an EV or an IC. Uh, sure. that, that's what Toyota wants to make, but they're being uh, uh, restricted by some of the people who would not let them go, go in that direction. That's just one example. More choices, the better. All of the above energy. Well, Congressman, on that note, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be following your work again. And, and you can follow us at c3newsmag.com and c3solutions.org. And uh, we'll uh, visit with you again.